Father in heaven, that is um, even our prayer and our thanksgiving and amazement and wonder that you have power to save sinners like us who only rebelled against you, committed treason against you in every thought and every word and every deed. And yet, you sent your son to be that offering, the substitute dying in our place. And oh, how you were pleased with his death, his act of love for us. And Lord, how we are pleased also with his death in our place. Where would our hope be if he had not? Oh, Father, would you now um, feed us with your word and strengthen our view and understanding of you. Help us to align our lives under your word that we might be pleasing to you. And Meet with us now. Help us to see you. Help us to see ourselves rightly in light of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Let's take our Bibles this morning and let's open them up to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. We're pressing on as we work through this letter. We need to back up once again into Romans 1 a little bit and then take a run into Romans 2 to help us understand Paul's argument that is going on here. Now, Romans 1 convincingly detailed for us that mankind is under the wrath of God. Right now, mankind is, and will be one day as well. And mankind knows his predicament, but mankind has chosen to stay there, wants to stay there. Man knows that God is right to execute a death sentence on man for doing unrighteousness. Look at chapter 1, verse 32. And although they know the ordinance of God, what's that? Well, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, worthy of a death sentence. They not only do the same unrighteousnesses listed above, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Man knows it's right for God to execute a death sentence on them for being and doing unrighteousness. And as we step into Romans chapter 2, one has arisen from that mass of humanity under the wrath of God, approving not the doing of the unrighteousness, but affirming the judgment deserved for doing unrighteousness. In chapter 2, verse 1, it's a man who passes judgment. Um, he's one who judges another. In verse 3, he passes judgment on those who practice such things. So he's a moralist of of sorts. He's concerned about morality in some sense, but he's primarily concerned with the immorality of others and unconcerned about his own. See, he practices the same things that they all do. Verse 1, you who judge practice the same things. And in verse 3, you do the same yourself. And so he's a moralist, but he's a hypocritical moralist. But what's going on in his head? Well, he reasons that he will actually escape judgment, verse 3. He supposes that when he passes judgment on others who do practice such things and he does the same himself, he supposes that he'll escape the judgment of God. It's like he's thinking, God, see how I affirm your judgment of the unrighteous. Do you see it? I even extend it myself toward them. God, we, we're so like-minded. We're so similar. Something makes him believe that he is in a position to be this way, to have favor with God to do such a thing. Something also makes this man believe that he needs no repentance at all. Verse 4, he thinks lightly of the riches of God's kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing, not wanting to know the, that the kindness of God leads him to repentance. He, he doesn't believe he needs it because, well, he and God are already on the same page about the judgment of others. 
And Paul came across such men like this over and over on his missionary journeys. And Paul's point in his unfolding argument here in Romans 2 is to take this man's thinking out at the knees. It's as if Paul is saying to him, so you actually find hope in thinking like a judge? Acting like a judge? A judge of others? Well, so Paul introduces him to the judge and how this judge thinks and acts in judgment. First of all, towards him, verse 5, what he's unaware of is that he, in his stubbornness and unrepentant heart, is actually storing up wrath for himself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. This is the God who will render to every man, to each person according to his deeds, and he gives some examples of how that will happen in verses 7 to 10. And then he concludes saying, this God is impartial. There is no partiality with God. God judges each man. He renders to each man what his deeds deserve, verse 6. That is the foundational principle of judgment. And the God doing that judgment doesn't play favorites. He has no favorites. And that would have been a shock to the hypocritical moralist. The hypocritical moralist thinks he's in a place of favorites with God. He thinks God has been partial toward him and he has wrong thinking about the impartiality, therefore, of God. So in this next section we are in today, verses 12 to 16, Paul offers even greater proof of his impartiality. We'll examine this morning five manifestations of God's impartiality. Five different ways of revealing how God is impartial. And these loom over the hypocritical moralist. These loom over every man. Let me read verses actually 11 to 16. For there is no partiality with God. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these, not having the law, are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them on the day when, according to my gospel... God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Now, this is an important reminder this morning. This is a judgment context. It is not a salvation context. How God judges every man is what's in view here, not how God saves some. Christians probably, in all honesty, don't spend enough time in passages on judgment corporately. I, I don't recall seeing a billboard anywhere that said, hey, next series, the judgment of God. Come on over. And we probably don't spend enough time on this subject individually either. And the result of this is the church is impoverished. We don't have a robust enough view of what the Bible teaches concerning the judgment of God. And I think one of the reasons we don't is because as gospel-loving people, as gospel-centered people, we believe the gospel in a wrong way, maybe not knowing so, we believe it has neutralized God's judgment of us completely. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? Romans 8.1, and we affirm that completely. And so judgment passages, I guess, are, I guess are all about unbelievers then, Right? And yet when we come across passages, like even this one in Romans 2, which touch on the judgment of all men, including believers, we, we start to get confused. And here's what we need to do in controlling ourselves when we come to God's word. Um, we can't allow what the Bible teaches about how God saves us to undo and mute the passages that teach how God judges, or vice versa. 
we need to do the hard work of understanding what the Bible teaches about both subjects, about how they're different. How God saves is not how God judges. But they are related, but because they're related, it doesn't mean they're equal either. We have trouble understanding how God could, could save us and yet still have a, a, a judgment of some kind for us to face. Certainly, the judgment that a believer faces is not like the judgment the unbeliever faces, but the Bible still calls what the believer faces judgment. And Romans 2 is not a context on how God saves us. We won't be there until chapter 3, verse 21. So while we expose this judgment passage to our hearts and to our minds, we get the opportunity to avoid two foolish errors. We need to avoid concluding that because God saved me entirely apart from works, therefore he won't judge me at all for what I've done. That's a foolish error. Or thinking, therefore, he is not concerned at all for what I do in life because he wasn't concerned about my works when he saved me. That's just simply not true. The Bible does not affirm anything like that. But we need to avoid the second error kind of back the other way. We should avoid concluding that because God judges all on the basis of what they have done, therefore, that means the way he saves me is on the basis of what I do. That's equally foolish and not affirmed by Scripture. We need to allow to stand what the Bible teaches about the God who saves by grace through faith alone entirely apart from works. That must stand, and without taking one thing away from that amazing gospel, we also need to let stand what the Bible teaches about the God who judges all men, including us, on the basis of what we have done. You see, the Bible is very comfortable with those two realities living side by side. And believer, you need to too. Believer, I'm going to give you two equal truths here as we are, this is the sermon before the sermon in case you didn't notice. Two equal truths to put up here. This is for the believer only. Two equal truths about God that stand in Scripture in perfect harmony, and therefore they need to stand in perfect harmony in our minds. Number one, when God saves us, believers, he is glorified through declaring us righteous quite apart from good works. And the way that we believe and have been taught as a church, I, I know you all affirm that and, and love that. That glorifies God. He is magnified through such a thing. Number two, when God judges us as believers, he is glorified through rewarding or vindicating us believers for having done his works that he gave us to do. Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, that we would walk in them. Jesus tells a parable about a Slaves who were given talents, they went away, they did work with those talents that came from their master. The day came when he called the master, the master called the slaves in and, and he said to them, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. This doesn't mean he saves on the basis of deeds any more than it means he won't be, that we won't be judged for our deeds because he saved us by faith alone. Do you understand that? So let's explore these five manifestations of God's impartiality. These manifestations loom over every man at judgment. The first manifestation is this. Sinners without law perish without law at judgment. Verse 12. The word for there confirms that each man will be dealt with impartially by God at judgment. And then two classes of humanity are addressed by Paul. The hypocritical moralist would have thought that the way to divide humanity was the way that Paul talked about it before by the Jew-Greek division line at judgment. You know, at a judgment, what matters in the hypocritical moralist's mind is whether you're a Jew or not. But our prior passage revealed that at judgment, that's not how God divides man up at all. 
Here's the big idea about the impartial God that we have at judgment. Even though appearances reveal two classes of people, the impartial God of judgment does not have two different standards for each group. He has only one standard of impartial judgment over both. And this would have been shocking to the hypocritical moralist. The first class in verse 12 are sinners without law. For as many as sinned without law, when those face the impartial God of judgment, they perish without law. As many as sinned does not mean that they committed an infraction along the way while not having law. The idea here of them mentioned as those who sinned means that they miss the mark entirely who is God. They miss the mark entirely. This sinning is what is the characteristic of their whole being and their whole life. Their life choice is to miss the mark. And this mark-missing life was one, by all initial appearances, to be one that was not within the boundaries of law. They are without law. And the law mentioned here, your translations go much farther than what Paul actually says in the Greek. Paul states law very generally here, not specific at all, just law. A better way to say it would be, for as many as sinned without law. Now this... Um, would have certainly included the idea of without the law of Moses given to Israel, but Paul states it so broadly that it included any group that didn't put itself inside the bounds of moral code. And again, the point is the life choice of this first class is to choose sinning, and they did so without being in the boundary of law, and they will perish. And perish is a strong word. It does not mean that they will be annihilated at judgment, but rather it means it is eternal ruin. It is eternal destruction. As they sinned without law, so they will perish without law. And that's the first manifestation of God's impartiality. And the Jew in Paul's day would have said what to this? Amen. Yes. God gave to us law. That group is outside this law that we have, and indeed they are sinners by choice in their whole life. And, and outside this law that was given to us, that class will perish. And that kind of thinking is addressed next by the next manifestation of God's impartiality at judgment. Number two, sinners with law will be judged by law at judgment. All who have sinned under the law. Under the law means in law, in the sphere of law, within the boundary of law. And again, Paul states it more generally here than your translation does. Uh, this would certainly apply to how a Jew thought with the Mosaic law, being within the boundaries of the Mosaic law, but Paul stated it so generally that it would be fitting for anyone in any situation similar to that. And notice how this one mentioned in this class is actually no different than the one in the first class. As many as sinned within the boundary of law. Sinned is mentioned again here. Not that this one committed an infraction along the way while living within the reach of law. No, they too are sinning. They're missing the mark entirely with their lifestyle. Their sinning is what is characteristic of their entire being. Their life choice is to miss the mark, and they did this mark-missing life while being in the boundary of law. As they sinned under law, so they are judged by law. Now, let's do a comparison contrast between these two classes. How are both groups the same? Well, both lives are marked comprehensively by sinning. It's what they both have chosen to do with their lives. It's what they're both known for. And both lives are devastated at judgment, perish, judged. What's different about them? One was without law, and the other was in the boundary of law. And here's the point. And for the one who prefers to sin as a way of life, the presence of law made no difference at judgment at all. 
the one who wanted sinning to be the banner over his life, you know, he practices the same things. Found the law was no advantage. The hypocritical moralist would be gasping for breath at this point. But where do you think this moralist got his morals? He's within boundary of law, within the boundary of law. He thought that was all that mattered. He didn't have to be different. His law put him in favor with God. So he wrongly thought. As a sinner, being with law will make no difference before an impartial God of judgment. At the, at the bottom of the abyss of, of God's wrath, the hypocritical moralist, he, he felt virtuous. He felt virtuous. He thought his relationship to law gave him a place to tell others how they weren't measuring up. And being so like-minded with God in that distorted and perverted way, he thought he would escape judgment, and he just learned otherwise. God will not show such a sinner with law favoritism at all. And that leads to the next manifestation of God's impartial judgment. Number three, Doers, not hearers of law, are vindicated at judgment. Doers, not hearers of law, are vindicated at judgment. Verse 13 begins with the word for. That means further truth about what Paul just said is coming. And Paul takes us back to the central truth of judgment. Again, judgment is rendered on the basis of what a man does. Look at verse 13, for it is not the hearers of the, word, of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. And Paul, even in verse 13, still keeps the law discussion very general. He doesn't make it sound like it's Mosaic law versus without law. It's just very ge- uh, generic and specific. It's not specific only to the Jewish idea of law, of their arrangement with Mosaic law. And he he talks about hearers of law. Hearers are the ones who heard it read to them. There was an interaction that they had with law, a, a proximity they had with law. But the point is that that is as far as it went. Hearing didn't translate into anything beyond that. He possesses law, or maybe you could say the law possesses him in his class. And Paul's point is there is no partialness. There's no favor at judgment for that one. That one is not just before God. That one is not put forth as right before God. The idea is it is not the hearers of law who are vindicated at judgment before God. When it comes to legal action, knowing law only, hearing law only doesn't vindicate you in any court of law. The point of law is always what? Conform to it. Do it. The only one vindicated by law is the one who does it. And that is what Paul says about God's judgment too. Verse 13, it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. They will be vindicated. They will be put forth as right. Maybe I could illustrate it to you this way. If, if you're being examined in a court of law and you plead with the judge that you, you heard the law, you, you know the law. In fact, you sat with an elder at your church and you diagrammed the law and you memorized the law. In fact, you cross-stitched it and hung it in your bathroom. And then you even taught the law to your children and you even, you even judged others when they didn't do that law, the judge would still not vindicate you or acquit you until when you did the law, until you actually conformed to the law and did it. That's just the way law and judgment work. You understand that. I know you do. And it's the same in God's great judicial setting as well. What's hard for us is that the same word is used in 
God's judgment that is used in salvation context, justification, to put forth as righteous. And what we need to grasp is the word has a range of usage for both settings. Here's how the word justification works in salvation settings. You're familiar with this. When God saves, he has a justification that operates there, doesn't he? And it's in connection only to faith. It's on the basis of faith alone, quite apart from works. Let me just take you one chapter, a little preview of what's to come. Chapter 3, verse 21, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. There is no distinction. His point is, verse 20, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Salvation context. So when God saves, he has a justification. God declares the one who believes to be righteous even though they had only ever been unrighteous. In salvation context, justification's meaning is tied to faith alone, quite apart from works. Now, in in Romans 2.13, this is how the word justification works in a judgment setting. When God judges which is different than how he saves. He has a justification which operates there also. But it is in connection only to works, quite apart from hearing only, memorizing only, diagramming only, cross-stitching only. If using the word vindication in a judgment setting is more helpful, do so. It's the idea. One is not vindicated in judgment until he conforms to law. And Scripture teaches both. Scripture holds on to both. The justification that occurs in salvation has no connection to works at all. That's how God saves those who believe. The vindication that occurs in judgment is only connected to works. That's how God judges. And so again, here are the foolish errors to avoid. I'll say it again for you. Avoid this. Avoid thinking, well, God justified me at salvation quite apart from works, so at judgment, well, I guess there won't even be a judgment for me because he's, he's, he's not interested in my works. That's simply not true. Let me take you to some passages we looked at last week. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. So what we're doing now is we're leaving a judgment context to go look at some other contexts. Romans 2 does not teach this. It sits alongside what other passages teach, so let's go to some other ones and help fill out our thinking a little bit. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Paul speaks on behalf of believers. Therefore, we believers also have as our ambition, whether at home in this body or absent from it, to be pleasing to him. In in what sense are we to be pleasing? Aren't we already pleasing to him? I mean, I'm declared righteous with his righteous on the basis of faith alone. I'm already acceptable and pleasing to him, aren't I? So in what sense do we strive to be pleasing with him? Well, Paul says, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his what? Deeds. He's not talking about unbelievers. Unbelievers do not want to be pleasing to the Lord. Believers want to be pleasing to the Lord through their deeds they do, and we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has what? Done, whether good or bad. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll add to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. Paul is talking about those who labor to build churches, not physically buildings, but to build up the body of Christ. He says in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 3, each man's what? Work will become evident for the day will show it. It's a day of judgment, that judgment seat of Christ. It um, it will, it will sh- the, I'm sorry, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's what? Work. 
If any man's what? Work, which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. Ah, see, it's judgment unto rewards for us. Judgment unto rewards for us. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Loss of a reward he could have had otherwise. But he himself will be saved. You see, it's a judgment that doesn't impact salvation. Yet we are saved as through the fire, the refining work. And now let's go to that Matthew 25 passage about the the talents given. Go to Matthew 25 and look at verse 21. Matthew 25, verse 21. You know the the parable the master gives to his slaves his own possessions and he trusted to them. To one he gave five talents, to another he gave two, and to another he gave one. And after a long time, verse 19, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I've gained five more talents. His master said to him what? He didn't say, well-believed, good, and trusting servant. What did he say? Well done. Good and faithful. Faithful servant. You see, God is concerned at judgment. You can go back to Romans chapter 2. And by the way, enter into the joy of your master. It was pleasing to the Lord that his, his, his slave did what he was supposed to do. Enter into my joy. God is concerned at judgment for the good works that he prepared for us believers to walk in. Ephesians 2.10. And he will assess those in judgment of us. Now the outcome of our judgment is not at all what the judgment of the unbeliever is. We've been redeemed from every lawless deed, Titus 2.14. But we were also, through Christ's death, made zealous for good deeds. We were made ready to stand before God who looks for good works. Have you thought of that? We've been prepared for that. And he will reward us in judgment. So avoid the foolish error that Because God justified me at salvation, quite apart from works, that means at judgment, he's not concerned with my works. No, he is. He made you ready for it. But we have to avoid the other error, too, that God, because God vindicates doers of law at judgment, that means God saves me on the basis of what I do, and that is equally off. Here's the judgment principle back in Romans 2, verse 13. Being in the boundaries of law... Hearing it when your life choice is to sin, merely possessing it when your life choice is to sin, it will not vindicate you at all at judgment. The way law and judgment work simply cannot vindicate that one. The only vindication law and judgment can render is for the one who is conformed to law. Who does it? Paul's giving us insight into the hypocritical moralist here. He possesses a moral standard or a law that makes him feel virtuous over others. But his life choice is to do the very same things that the unrighteous do. He is one who sins, yet is under law. Merely possessing law for the hypocritical moralist does not vindicate him. It does not grant him favor before an impartial God. He thinks he's so like God, so like-minded when he judges others by his moral standard, and that is so dangerous. The greatest outrage against any law, against any judge, is to know it, to hear it, diagram it, cross-stitch it, memorize it, teach it, but not do it. Let me put this into your court, maybe in your family, where you can imagine having a family in this sense. As a mom or dad, you put a rule around your child, or you put your child in your rule, in your law. And here's the rule. Clean your room. Okay? So you put a law, uh, your child in the law, in the rule. You, mom, dad, you get to judge 
whether your child conformed to your rule or not, don't you? When can you vindicate your child in regards to your rule? Only when he or she does it. You judge that they are vindicated only when they conform to your law, and that has nothing to do with whether or not you will accept them as your child. It's just the way judgment and law work. This is the third manifestation of God's impartial judgment. He will not play favorites with lifestyle sinners simply because they have some kind of connection to law. From his impartiality, he's only looking for doers of law to vindicate at judgment. But then wait a minute. What does that mean then for the one that Paul said was without law? How fair is that? It sounds like, based on how Paul described them, that they don't even have a law that they could even try to do to be vindicated by. Well, that's the fourth manifestation of God's impartial judgment. Number four, Gentiles without law are judged by their inward law. Four in verse 14, and those who do not have law, Gentiles who do not have law, points us back to Romans 2.12, the first part there, in light of what was just said in the rest of verse 12 and 13. And again, even um, at the beginning of verse 14, Paul keeps the law discussion very general. He doesn't even become specific yet about which law it is. And that case would certainly fit here with what Paul is saying about the Jew and the Gentile, the Gentile not having Mosaic law, but he still hasn't made that specific case yet. It's coming. When, in verse 14, should be whenever. And the idea here at the beginning of verse 14 doesn't mean that the Gentiles um, are, are, are always doing, frequently finding themselves doing the things of the law. Rather, it's, it's much more an unknown if they'll do it at all. If it happens that they do, whenever they do, it is done instinctively. So the impression in verse 14 here is not uh, being made is, is that the, it, this happens rather frequently for the Gentiles, that they rather frequently find themselves doing the things of the law. When they do them, they do them instinctively. Do you see that in verse, four, uh, verse 14? That means by nature, naturally. Naturally, they, they know how to do it by some kind of gut sense. What do they do? They do the things of the law. Now we are specific, the law. The, the pieces of it, the collectibles of that specific law that, that one class indeed does possess. Now, the Jew-Gentile distinction with Mosaic law would surely fit into this idea, wouldn't it? For that case, the Gentile who is outside the boundaries of Mosaic law at times finds himself doing pieces, things of Mosaic law quite by inward nature. He, he does a murder. He, he, he oftentimes does not steal. Uh, perhaps he even fulfills his obligation. Perhaps he honors his parents and so forth. And notice what Paul says to Gentiles like that who have no formal connection to law. He says in verse 14, these, not having law, are a law to themselves. They become their own walking code to themselves. They become their own walking law to themselves. They confront themselves with law. Others outside them don't have to bring a code of conduct from the outside to them and surround them with it because they themselves are their own walking law and they confront themselves with their own law. How is this so? Verse 15, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts. The work of the law is written in their hearts, not the law itself. This is not a fulfillment of the new covenant in their lives. This is the work of the law. That means the aim that the law is after or the, 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 the principle that the law is after, the point, the requirement of the law, the work that law is supposed to achieve, the duty of it. The duty being done sometimes instinctively by a Gentile is proof that the outcome of the law is actually written in their inner man, in their hearts, their inner person before God. It's not written on a stone. It's not written on parchment or on a scroll kept someplace externally. So here's Paul's development. In verse 12, there's obvious law 
externally written down perhaps somewhere, and one class is more obviously connected to that law, it looks like at first glance there's another group who appears to not be connected to law at all, especially when compared to that other class that is. But now we discover otherwise. The reality is that the class we thought obviously had no connection to an external law isn't, after all, completely empty of law without law. And Paul takes us into their heart to prove it. How are Gentiles a walking law to themselves? Do you know they actually have a courtroom within their own heart? Look at this in verse 15. They have the work of the law in their heart, and they also have a witness Like in a court of law, there's a witness to their behavior in their inner courtroom, their conscience bearing witness. The conscience has seen the behavior of the Gentile in relation to the work of the law on their heart, and conscience has an opinion as to the rightness or wrongness of the behavior. It's an opinionated testimony concerning the behavior So within the Gentiles, without an external law, these who have no external law, there is the work of the law in the heart. There is a witness to what the Gentiles have done. And there is also, do you know this, a jury deliberating within the Gentiles? Look at verse 15. Their thoughts or their reasonings Their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. The idea here in the original is that the thoughts within the Gentile, they they band together. They they gang up together on the Gentile upon hearing the opinionated witness of the conscience. And the idea here in the original is that the predominant, most obvious conclusion the jury of the inner thoughts comes to is that the Gentile is guilty. The jury accuses him. Or, on occasion, far less than accusing, the inner thoughts sometimes excuse the Gentile based on what he did in connection to the work of the law within. And here's the point that Paul is making about the impartiality of God at judgment. These two things, listen. The Jew... Or, or anyone like him who has an external law surrounding him, who is in the boundaries of that law, they can hear it, they can interact with it, they can be a possessor of it externally so. And the same is true for the Gentile who does not have a law like that in that sense. He has the work of law, that law, within. And boy, does he interact with it too. Inwardly, because his conscience... And his inner thoughts are all constantly speaking, talking, deliberating about the work of the law. And he's very active with that in himself. How does this manifest the impartiality of God? Well, verse 13, it's not the hearers of law who are just before God and the doers of law will be justified. That's for the Jew. And it's also for the Gentile. Because it is possible for them to be hearers of everything that's going on inside their hearts, but not do it. This happens in an inward way for them. The Jew isn't in a position of favor because he has Mosaic law. The Jew who sins by choice. God is impartial at judgment. Based on deeds that they do, they will be judged. And The Gentile isn't being treated unfairly because he doesn't have an external law to conform to. He has one internally and he knows it. And God is impartial at judgment based on the deeds that he has done in connection to the inward work of law. The Gentile can't say, I didn't know. I didn't know. The Jew has no advantage over the Gentile and the Gentile isn't more disadvantaged than the Jew. And that brings us to the final manifestation of God's impartiality at judgment. Number five, the gospel announces Christ's penetrating judgment of man. This reveals something so kind about an impartial God at judgment. Let's walk through it and then we'll make that point. Verse 16, it should start off saying, in the day when, not on the day Paul is is trying to make a connection between what he just said and the day of judgment he's about to mention in verse 16. 
the whole internal busy courtroom drama going on inside should not and must not be thought of as some isolated um, courtroom sense all by itself. It is in direct connection with God's day of judgment. Um, when a Gentile goes through that inner courtroom dialogue in his heart every day, he needs to make a connection from that inner courtroom to God's greater impartial courtroom of judgment on judgment day. This all goes on, the conscience bearing witness and the thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them in connection with the day when according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men. It's in connection with it. What was internally going on in that heart courtroom, God sees. He sees the secrets. God will not sit back on his day of judgment and be satisfied with a, a parade of external deeds that come before him. Oh, he will look at every single one of them, and he will render to every single person what they've done. But he will also even judge the inner courtroom scene of the heart. And this penetrating judgment will take place through Christ Jesus. Do you see that? God, the impartial judge, has given all judgment over to his son, Jesus Christ. The man, Jesus, a man from Nazareth, a man from Nazareth is going to judge all of the nations who ever walk this earth. God, the impartial judge, gives all judgment to the man, Jesus. He will see the secret deliberations inside me inside you, all will face this man one day, that day of judgment. All secrets will be seen and exposed through him in judgment. And you say, how on earth is there anything kind <laughs> in this? In connection with the day when, this phrase, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men. Let me state it to you another way so you understand how this phrase, according to my gospel, works. What if, what if it was said this way? In connection with the day when, according to newspaper reports, God will judge the secrets of men. When we say something like that, we don't mean that the standard for judging is the newspaper and the contents within it. God's judgment of the secrets of men is not according to the contents of the gospel, what Paul is saying is that his good news is what announces this penetrating judgment of man. The gospel that Paul preaches is what tells you this bad news about how far God will go within when he judges you and me. And again, you say, how does this reveal anything kind about the impartial God of judgment? God could announce this penetrating judgment that you and I are condemned without any evidence anywhere of any good news for us. He could do that, but he didn't. Like this, if, if you were lying on the side of the road dying, bleeding to death perhaps, and the one who stopped was the mortician with a hearse. You're in a bad, bad condition, and the mortician showing up is like a vulture showing up. There's no evidence in that. There's no sign, no hint of anything good anywhere within that bad news pulling up. That is not the impartial God of judgment. It's not. Instead, if you were dying on the side of a road and a doctor stopped and looked at you and he confirmed, you're dying. But I can help you. That's kindness. That's kindness. And that is exactly the point in verse 16. The impartial God, listen, don't underestimate this. He is relentlessly impartial in judgment. He shows no favors. By his own righteousness, he will not deviate from his own righteousness, from his own righteous standard. He will not be persuaded to show partiality to anyone. He will render to each person what he has done. But he has determined to tell you that bad news through his message of good news. And 
that's kind. The good news first announces bad news. As a sinner by life choice, you're so dead in your sin that if you were to add law to your sinful condition, it doesn't help you at judgment at all. And if you as a, a sinner by life choice, if, if you choose to reject all external moral codes about you and instead you choose to live by your gut, by your heart, you will eternally perish. According to the gospel, the announcements of this gospel, this is what will happen at judgment. It's bad news. But the good news centers in on this man, Christ Jesus, who judges. He's the judge. And he was judged at the cross. He was judged there as that substitute that John talked about earlier. Dying in the place, suffering in the place of those that God saves. Taking all of the wrath of God upon himself somehow in an afternoon, an eternity of hell somehow compressed on that man. For me, for you. How will you meet him? Meet him as the one judged to condemnation in your place. Meet him that way. Entrust your life to him. Believe him. Seeing his kindness towards you already and his tolerance and his patience towards you, seeing all of that, repent. Turn away from living for yourself and entrust your life to him, believe him. And you will find your life being so transformed by him that you will be prepared by him to stand faultless before him at a judgment seat one day. He will say, if you trust in him, he will say, at judgment, well done. Good and faithful servant. When you entrust your life to this one, everything changes. Every lawless deed forgiven. New power, new equipping to do good deeds. To stand before him. He will not cast you off at all if you come to him by faith alone. Now, if you won't, you will face an impartial judge who will single you out at judgment and he will render to you what you deserve, wrath and indignation. And you will experience tribulation and distress in your soul forever under his righteous wrath. Why would you not come to him today? Why? You must. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, will you extend your mercy, show your power to save, like we just sang. Take the, the young one sitting here who knows that they've been living within the external code of their mom and dad, but they are sinners by life choice. Lord, take these young ones, help them to see they need a savior, Jesus, to die in their place. Help them to trust in him and in him alone. And anybody else here this morning, 
O oh God, be merciful as you were to me, as you will have been to so many here, Lord. Be merciful yet again. Thank you for the riches of your kindness, and your tolerance, and your patience. Let those things be seen with new eyes today so that repentance can take place. We ask it in your son's precious name.